Okay, uh, we are go now going to go over the safety test. Uh, and I'm recording this so that I can use this recording later. Uh, the plan is we are going to talk about every single question on the test. And I'm going to ask you guys, you know, we're going to go through in, in order and I'm going to have each one of you in turn read one of the questions and tell me what you think the answer is. And then we're going to talk about what the answer actually is. And we're going to talk about why the answer is the right answer. Uh, and so I'm trusting that you guys have already uh, taken the test, just using your best judgment, using common sense. And uh, I, I expect that you probably got most of the questions right, because most of the questions are just common sense questions. But a few of them are, uh, there's a little bit more to them than that. Uh, so let me start sharing. So you should all be seeing my screen right now. Okay. And so let's, uh, let's go through the list here. Now let me make a note of who is not here so that I don't call on people who are not here. Okay. And okay. All right. So Zaid, would you please uh, unmute yourself? Read the first question and then tell us which of these four choices do you think is the right answer? Eye protection, such as safety glasses, must be worn. I put, uh, if anyone in the shop is using any tools, power or otherwise. Okay. All right. That is the right answer. Now, a lot of people think that C is the right answer. A lot of people think that uh, if someone in the lab is using a power tool, then yeah, for sure, we need to wear glasses. But they think that it's okay to not wear glasses if somebody's using what we call a hand tool. A hand tool would be anything like a, like a, uh, a hammer or a, a screwdriver or something like that. Uh, now, I will admit that if somebody's using just a screwdriver, the odds of anything coming flying off and, and getting into the eye of the people around them, you know, pretty low if you're using a screwdriver. But if you're using a hammer, then not so low. I mean, you hit something with a hammer and pieces can go flying. And uh, so, so what, what I do just to make it safe and make sure we have one rule that's consistent across the board is I say, if anybody in the lab is using any tools at all, then everybody in the lab needs to be wearing safety glasses. Now, you could argue that that's kind of overkill. You know, if somebody's just using a screwdriver, then, hey, is it really necessary? And, you know, you've got a good argument there. But I think just to be consistent, let's make that rule. If anybody in the lab is using any tools at all, everybody in the lab needs to be wearing their safety glasses. Okay, so if you didn't get that question right, then you know, cross it out now and put in the correct answer. The correct answer is B. All right, next, how about Austin, can you read question number two for us and tell us what you think is the right answer? If you find a power tool with a frayed power cord, what should you do? And I said A. Okay, now why would you not try to fix the frayed cord there, Austin? What's, what's wrong with B? Probably, I mean, I don't know. It's kind of hard to fix a frayed cord. You might not know how to do it. It's better to have the teacher know what to do first. Yeah, absolutely. Do not try to fix the frayed cord yourself. You might fix it improperly and frayed cords can easily kill people. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I did when, back when I was an engineer and I was going, undergoing the yearly safety training, which, which by the way, you know, with safety training, you have to do it every year. Those of you that took this test previously and you asked me the other day, you said, do I really need to take it again? And the answer is yes, because you need to be reminded. So when I was in, in industry, we had to do the safety training every year, even if we'd you know, done it over the course of the past 20 years. One of the times that I took the safety test, uh, one of the times that I did the safety training, they brought in a, uh, uh, well, or they showed us a video that really stuck with me. 
um, the guy, they showed a guy who walks in and sits down on the stool and looks into the camera. And he described to the camera how he killed his friend. Now, obviously, he didn't kill him intentionally. But this was exactly the case. He said that he, he had gone into the lab and he saw there was a, a drill, a hand drill, not a cordless drill, but the, the old plug-in kind. And he noticed that the cord was frayed. So he said, well, hey, I'll, I'll go ahead and just fix this frayed cord. So he, he opened it up and fixed the frayed cord, or at least he thought he had, put it back together again. What he didn't realize that he had gotten some wires swapped. And uh, so, so he had what he thought was a fixed tool. And then he just put it back on the shelf and he went home. Next morning, his, his friend walked into the room. Uh, he needed to drill something. So he picked up the drill. He plugged it into the uh, wall socket and bzzz, his friend was dead. Okay, because the guy who fixed it didn't fix it properly. And it can be extremely dangerous. Hang on a sec here. We just got a new student walked in. Let me let him in. Okay. All right, so definitely do not fix frayed cords. And also C is bad. If, if you see a cord that's frayed, do not just put it back in the tool cabinet because the next person who comes along, they might not notice that the cord is frayed. They might try to use it and bzz, they might be killed. So absolutely positively, if you see any problem with any tool whatsoever, bring it to me or bring it to my attention. Uh, do not just uh, ignore it. Okay, we're on to number three now. So this time let's do Moses. Can you unmute yourself and read us the question and tell us what you think is the answer? Oh, you want me to read the uh, question? Yeah, please. Uh, when disconnecting portable power tools from a power receptacle, you should, um, was it? Let me find. I think I put. Uh, B. Always leave it plugged in. Um, let me suggest that that's not the way we want to do it. I mean, there are some tools that I do always leave plugged in, but not very many. Most of them we want to unplug them when we're done. So try again. Uh, let's. I'll do C then probably. Okay, very good. Yeah, so if you're ever unplugging something, uh, make sure you hold on to the plug itself, not the cord. The, I see people do this all the time because it's easy to just grab the cord and just pull on the cord, right? But when you do that, you could, you could uh, pull it out from the plug and that's how you get frayed cords and things. So don't just grab the cord and pull on it, please. Grab the plug itself, hold on to the plug and pull there. So number three, the correct answer is C. All right, we're up to number four now. So let's go with uh, Elijah. Can you please read it and tell us what you think the answer is? Uh, long hair, loose clothing, jewelry, and long sleeves need what kind of attention? And I said uh, the answer is A. Uh, all clothing should be tucked in or rolled back, such as long sleeve. Loose jewelry must be removed and long hair should be tied up. Okay. And this one, I think, is pretty much common sense. Yeah. Anything that might possibly get caught by the blade of the uh, saw or, you know, the whatever, uh, definitely needs to be put away. So, yeah, A is clearly the right answer, and most people don't have any trouble with that one. Okay. Let's go on to number five. Uh, and so how about... Um, uh, David, can you do this one? I said apply direct pressure to the wound. Yeah, read us, read us the question, please. Uh, it says if a person is bleeding profusely from a cut, the first action to take is, and I said, apply direct pressure to the wound. Okay, now uh, a lot of people, and that, by the way, that is the right answer. But a lot of people think that you should call for help first. And uh, the, the key word in here that makes that makes A be the wrong answer is this word, uh, this word right here. Come on, why is my, uh, my screen doesn't want to work? Okay, 
So it's this word right here, profusely. Um, so, uh, David, what does the word profusely mean? Uh, when they're bleeding, if it's like it hit an artery and it's like spraying everywhere, I would say that's pretty profusely. That would definitely be profuse, yeah. But even if it wasn't uh, an arter arterial cut, I mean, if, if a lot of blood is coming out, that would be profuse, okay? And so uh, the very first thing that you should definitely do is apply direct pressure to the wound. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have had any first aid training, <clears throat> but uh, if, you just, if you just apply direct pressure, so let me, let me stop sharing for a second. Okay. I have actually had experience where I had to do this for real. Luckily, it was not at Ames, it was somewhere else where someone had cut themselves and they were bleeding. I mean, it wasn't spurting out, but there was a, a significant amount of blood coming out. And just by putting your hand on there and just pressing with your hand, it does an amazing job of slowing the blood down tremendously. Now, that may not can stop it completely, but it can certainly slow it way down. And so th that should be your first instinct. If anybody's bleeding profusely, is just apply direct pressure right on the wound there. Uh, now, in reality, I mean, the best thing to do is if you can call for help at the same time you're doing this. So if any of you ever, you know, ho I hope this doesn't happen, but if any of you ever get cut, okay, then what I would recommend is apply direct pressure. And, at, and then as soon as you got that pressure on there, I want you to yell, Mr. Hendricks, get over here now. Okay, and I will come running. So hopefully you can do the two of them simultaneously is basically what I'm getting at. But if you could only, you know, if you have to choose one right answer here, the correct answer is apply direct pressure. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, hang on a second here while I... Okay. So we're up to number six now. Uh, so Presley, can you please read the question and tell us what you think the right answer is? An operator zone refers to... Um, I picked C, the area of the shop floor where the machine operator only should stand. Okay, that is correct. When a person is operating uh, a power tool, you do not want to risk accidentally bumping into them. The results could be very, very bad. All right, so uh, in many shops, uh, like for instance, if you go into the Cottonwood Wood Shop and you look at uh, the various tools that they have, you'll notice that they have painted on the floor red areas. Uh, and so by looking at what they painted on the floor, then you know that that is the operator area and the, only the person operating the tool is allowed to, to step inside that red zone. Everybody else has to stay out of it. Now at Ames, we don't have the luxury of painting things on the floor because we just, we don't have the kind of space that's needed to do that. Uh, we, have to, we have to be flexible. So what we do instead for our operator zone is we go with what we call the arm's length rule. So imagine you're, you're the operator, you're standing in front of the machine, you're using the machine. If you were to take your arm and hold your arm out like that and swing around in a circle, okay, that is the operator zone. And so all of you people who are not the operators, if you ever need to walk by, you are not allowed to pass within arm's length of the person who is operating the tool. Okay, you must stay arm's length away from that person at all times. That is the operator zone here at Ames. Uh, okay. Uh, now we're into some uh, fill in the blank things. Um, so Luke. Can you please read us question number six and tell us what do you think goes in the blank there? <clears throat> you must never allow your fingers to get closer than six inches to the cutting blade or drilling bit of a power tool. All right, now how did you arrive at the number six? Uh, sounded nice. Okay, it does sound nice. Um, here is one of the questions that uh, just using common sense uh, you, you know, it's not obvious what number to come up with. Um, if you were to ask 
10 different engineering teachers or shop teachers, what is the rule that they use? You would probably get five different answers. There isn't any one for sure right answer to this question. Um, so at Ames, what we do is we use the four inch rule. If my, why is my screen just not allowing me to, there is something really funny going on with Canvas or with the, with Zoom right now. Okay, here we go. Okay, we go with the four inch rule. Uh, and the reason that we use the four inch rule is because that's what the Cottonwood shop teacher uses. And uh, so just to be consistent, I, I want to go with the same rule. Now, six inches would be safer, but there, there is a limit where if you get the number too big, then students will find it hard to use the tool, you know, because sometimes you need to get your fingers in there. So four inches is the rule that we go with at Ames, just because that matches the rule that the Cottonwood uh, Woodshop teacher uses, okay? So remember that whenever you're using any power tool, never let you get, your fingers get closer than four inches to the cutting blade or the drilling bit. Okay, now question number seven looks like it's the same question as number six, except there is something different and it's important. So let's see, Eliza, can you read us question number seven and tell us what you think is the right answer and why? You must never allow your fingers to get closer than I said six because it just also sounded nice inches to any moving part of a robot. Okay, um, I see why you might have done that. Now, Eliza, tell me what's the difference between question number six and question number seven? So question number six has like blades involved, which can easily cut you. And question number seven um, is just parts of a moving robot. So maybe not as dangerous. Okay. Well, actually more, more dangerous oh, okay. actually is the right. Wait, the, uh, the question number seven is asking about a robot. Question number six is asking about something like a drill press or you know, you know, a bandsaw. The difference between a, a drill press and a robot is robots can get up and move around. Um, drill, drill presses don't, don't get up and move around, robots do. And so robots are more dangerous potentially uh, in that regard. Uh, and so the number that we put in as our answer for number seven needs to be bigger than the number we put in for number six, just because of the possibility that the robot might start moving, okay? And so what we do is we go with the 12 inch rule or the one foot rule. So if you are ever working on a robot, okay, if that robot is energized, then you must not let your fingers get within 12 inches of the robot. If you need to work on the robot, you need to disconnect all the power, okay, before you're allowed to touch the robot, just because, you know, robots can move around and you never know, it might start moving when you're not expecting it to. All right, number eight. How about uh, Tanner? Can you read this one and tell us what you think the answer is? Uh, yeah. You should not use a grinder on parts made of aluminum because, and I said, the dust. I can understand why you might say that, but the reason is actually slightly different. Um, now, first off, let's make sure that everybody knows what a grinder is. Um, I wish that we were in the lab because I could actually take you in and show you the grinder. But uh, there's this big wheel that's made out of stone, and this wheel spins. So if you have a piece of metal that you've just got through cutting um, and it's got sharp edges on it, then what you can do is you can take it over the grinder and start the wheel spinning. And then you can uh, hold the metal up there and it'll grind off all the sharp edges. And you know maybe it's got a, a, a sharp corner and you wanna round off that corner. Um, so grinders are very useful things, but Grinders are not intended to be used on aluminum because aluminum has a really low melting temperature. And so what's going to happen with aluminum, if you put it on the grinder, is that the aluminum will melt and then the melted aluminum 
will fill in all of the little pits on the grinder. Uh, in order for a grinder to work effectively, it has to have a rough surface. So if you've got melted aluminum filling in all the little pits there, then the grinder is not going to have a rough surface after a while. It's going to be it's going to be uh, quite smooth. In fact, when we when we go into the lab, I'm going to take you to the grinder and I'm going to show you. You're going to see lots of silvery spots on it, where people have violated this rule and they've tried to grind aluminum, and so it's starting to fill in. And so the the grinding wheel is getting to where it's not as good as it was when it was new. And if this continues, I'm going to have to just throw it out and get a new grinder wheel. Okay, so I realize that's a lot of words to put in a short, in a small space. So what I would recommend that you just put in here is just say that the melted aluminum will make the grinder wheel uh, ineffective. That, yeah, which again, that's a lot of words too. But if you, if you cram it in there, okay, the melted aluminum will ruin the, the grinder wheel. That's a good way to perhaps say it. Um, okay, so uh, somebody just asked me what was the answer to number seven again? The answer to no number seven is 12 inches, 12 inches. Okay, um, so let's talk about number nine. And how about, let's go with uh, one. Can you read us number nine and tell us what you think the answer is? Um, a fire extinguisher is located blank in the ends in the mirroring lab, and I thought on the wall. Yeah, you know, which wall? Lab. East side wall. Mm, good guess, but there's nothing on the east side wall. So uh, here's what I want you to write in here. So, so you'll notice nine and ten. So there's two fire extinguishers in the lab. <clears throat> so the first fire extinguisher is located. Uh, next to Martha's door. So just write that in there, say next to Martha's door. And then number 10, the second fire extinguisher is located um, by, the, by the first aid kit, which question number 11 says, where is the first aid kit located? So uh, the answer is in the southeast corner of the lab. Okay, so just for number 10 and number 11, uh, you, for both questions, write in that, the, that it's in the southeast corner of the lab. Okay. All right, number 12. How about uh, Caden? Can you read this one to us and tell us what you think the answer is? Um. Forcing your work machine into a machine um, means that you are, uh, I don't know, pressing it too hard. Pressing it too hard, that's right, yes. Uh, so if you ever hear anybody say, hey, you're forcing your work, what they mean is that you're pushing too hard, okay? Now, question number 12 and question number 13 really go together. So, uh, Caden, I'd like you to also do number 13. What do you think is a common reason why it is that people force their work. Now, there are lots of reasons, but there is one reason in particular that I am looking for. Why, why do you think they do it? And if that's the case, what should they do to avoid the problem? Um, maybe impatience that or frustration? Is, that, that is a common reason. Uh, and so if that's the case, then you should just be more patient. Um, I'm looking for a different reason. So how about if I tell you what the reason is that I'm looking for? Okay, the, the one I'm looking for is that if the, if the cutting edge is dull, that would be the reason why people force their work. So let's suppose that you're, you've got a drill, and the hand drill, and you're, so you're sitting there and, you're, and you know that you've, you've drilled before and you know, you know that the, it should be, should be cutting its way through but for some reason it's not, uh, you know, here you're pushing and you're pushing and it's just taken forever for this drill to go through the material. And so you're tempted to force it, you're tempted to push harder, okay? So, uh, so Caden, if the reason that people are forcing their work is because the cutting edge is dull, then uh, show what, 
what should they do to uh, to make it so they don't have to force their work? Um, stop cutting with a dull edge and get a better edge. Very good, yes. Uh, they should replace the cutting tool. Um, so if it's a drill bit, they should get a better drill bit. If it's a jigsaw, they should, they should swap it out for a, a saw blade that's not dull, okay? So, so that's, that's what I wanna see in question number 13. A common reason people force their work is because the cutting tool is dull. And so if you find that you're needing to force your work, you should change the cutting, uh, cutting tool for a sharper tool. And by the way, what do you do with the dull tool? Do you just put it back in the shelf? Answer, no. What you do is you bring it to me and I will look at it and I will decide whether I should throw it out or resharpen it or whatever. But bring it to me if you suspect that the cutting edge is dull. All right, number 14 here. How about uh, Joey? Joey, can you please unmute yourself and read us number 14 and tell us what you think the answer is? Earth calling Joey, come in Joey. Yeah, sorry, I had myself muted in multiple places. <clears throat> Paint, enamel, and la uh, lacquer or solvents must, be must not be used near flames or sparks because they are blank. I. You, you started to say I, and then I didn't hear what you said after that. Oh, um, I, don't, I don't remember what I put for this. I don't have my paper with me. Well, you shouldn't need a paper. Use your common sense. This is one of the questions where your common sense should, be, should give you an obvious answer. They're flammable. They're flammable, right. Okay, duh, right? This one's an easy one, all right? Uh, question number 15. Uh, how about Luke? Before using any power tool for the first time, you must get the permission of your instructor. Okay, very good. And this is something that I want everybody to understand very clearly. Uh, before this, uh, this period ends, you guys will all have passed the safety test. That does not repeat not mean that you can then walk into the lab and use any power tool in there. You have to be trained individually, separately for each power tool. Okay, so do not just walk in there and use any power tool. You have to get my permission first, and I'm only going to give my permission when I am convinced that you know how to use it safely. All right, number 16, how about Joe? Oh, sorry, I take that back. Joe is one of the people who's not here. Okay, so ignore that. Uh, Don's. Lead free solder is preferred over lead based solder because of lead fumes. Yeah, because lead is a poison and you don't want to go breathing the lead fumes. And you also don't want to get the lead on your hands either. So I would, I would put both of them down. One is so there's two answers here. One is you don't want to breathe lead fumes. And number two is you don't want to get lead residue on your hands. Now, uh, Don's, can you take a few seconds and tell us what is this solder of which you speak? So solder, what is solder? There is something seriously wrong with my touch screen. So from what I know, solder is like a metal component that you can melt to put two electrical components together. Very good, yeah. So think of it like hot glue, only in, instead, of, instead of being made out of the stuff that hot glue is made out of, it's a, very, it's a metal that has a very low melting point. And so you can use it to stick things together and have them be electrically connected. Okay, so Don's uh, 16, question 16 and 17 go together. Um, can you read us number 17 and tell us what you think the answer is? If you must use lead-based solder when soldering, you must wash your hands afterwards. Yeah, that one's a duh, right? 
Okay, very good. All right, uh, number 18, how about uh, Presley? Um, you somehow activated my Google Assistant. Um, um, so I put auto combustion means that something can start burning all by itself, even if there are no external sources to start the, to ignite the fire. Okay, good. Auto combustion is a term that I have heard used for this one. Um, so even even though that that is the term that is sometimes used, I would prefer that you guys use a different term. I want you to use the term spontaneous combustion. This is the more, more commonly used term. So spontaneous combustion, right? And so this is important, guys. Um, when you are working with anything that is oily, um, you know, if, if you spill any oil on the uh, table or on the ground, if you were to take a rag and uh, use the rag to soap up the, the oil, um, that rag can undergo spontaneous combustion. It can start on fire by itself. Now, it won't happen uh, until hours after you, you throw that oily rag in the garbage can, but uh, because it takes a couple hours for it to happen. There have been many, many, many buildings that have burned down because somebody used a rag in order to clear up, clean up an oil spill, and then they just threw that rag in the garbage. And then what happened was they went home, um, and during the night while they were sleeping, the, there's a chemical reaction that takes place between the oil and the cotton in the rag and the oxygen in the air. And this chemical reaction takes place now. It's a very slow reaction. It takes several hours before this reaction builds up enough heat. But, but, and so that's why this usually happens in the middle of the night, which is the worst time to happen because nobody's there. You know, everybody's home in bed at that time. So the middle of the night, this garbage can all of a sudden catches on fire all by itself through spontaneous combustion. And then the building burns down. So never, never, never put oily rags in a garbage can. If you ever have to clean up an oily spill or, or lacquer or any kind of a flammable solvent, okay, uh, bring me the oily rag and I will deal with the oily rag. I will, I will take care of uh, disposing of it safely. Never, never, never put an oily rag in a garbage can. All right, question number 19, how about uh, let's go with Austin. While those students are allowed to use table saws at some other schools, they are strictly forbidden to use the Ames table saw because, and I said because it's dangerous. Uh, okay, but elaborate on that. Why is it that it's okay to use it at other schools, but not Ames? Why, why is the Ames table saw more dangerous than other schools? I don't know. Okay. Is, some, is it like a special kind or something? Yeah, it is a special kind. Um, so at other schools, they have a special kind of uh, table saw. Well, actually, first saw. do you guys know what a table saw is? <clears throat> okay, so if we were in the lab, I would, I would take you in and I would show you. But a table saw is a special saw where, where in fact, let me open up a whiteboard so I can draw you a picture here, all right. All right, so, so here's, what is the matter with my touch screen? This is really annoying. Okay, so this is the floor and here's the table, okay? So the blade is underneath the table with just the little tip of the blade sticking out. So then what you do is you take the thing you want to cut and you push it there and, and, and this, this blade can lift up. So if you need it to lift up higher, it can lift up higher. So you push it there and, 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 it, and it cuts. Okay, so that, that's called a table saw. If you, will, if you go into the Ames lab uh, that's next to my classroom, 
you will see there is not a table saw in there. I keep the table saw hidden away because I don't want there to be any possibility that somebody might say, oh, what's this? Let's turn it on and use it. Table saws have cut off more fingers than any other tool in, in the lab or in, in, in any labs. Table saws have done far more damage to people than any other tool. They're just inherently really, really dangerous. Uh, and so what has happened has, is there have been, in recent years, a company had came, has come up with a really neat new table saw that's called a saw stop. And it's got a special sensor so that it is constantly measuring uh, something called capacitance. But let's not go into all the details. It, there's a thing where it can monitor the blade and it knows if the blade touches anything that's not made out of wood. Uh, and like for instance, a finger, but also it could be, maybe you've got a piece of nail. If you've got a nail in the wood and, and you're, you're uh, trying to cut something that has a nail in it, as soon as the blade touches that nail, the, the, the thing doesn't know whether it's a nail or whether it's a finger, but it knows that it's not wood. And it will instantly stop that blade and uh, hopefully stop it before your finger gets cut off. So you might have a little nick in your finger, but at least you'll still have a finger, right? So these, these special types of table saws called saw stops, they are very large. They're so large that we just don't have room to have them in the lab. Um, and, and so if you ever need to use a table saw to cut wood, then I will take you into the cottonwood wood shop and we will use their saw. If you ever need to use a table saw to cut metal, then you must definitely not use the cottonwood wood, wood, uh, cottonwood wood shop table saw because if you try to cut metal, it's gonna immediately stop the blade. And by the way, when the blade stops, it's an explosive mechanism that stops it. So it ruins the blade and you have to recharge the thing. And it costs like about $300. Every, every, time, every time you activate this emergency stop feature, it, it's, it's about $300 to, to get the, the thing back working again. So you definitely don't wanna accidentally go hitting it. But I'll gladly pay the, I mean, given the choice between paying $300 and somebody losing their finger, I will, I will gladly pay the $300, okay? That's an easy choice. So when we need to use a table saw in metal, I have a table saw that I keep locked away. And so if we need to use it, I will get it out. I personally will use the table saw. And when I'm done, I will put the table saw back. Okay. If you guys ever go into the lab and you see the table saw sitting there, you need to understand, do not use it. And in fact, don't just leave it there. If you see the table saw out, come and get me so, so I can put the table saw away so I can lock it up the way it's supposed to. All right, so that's a long answer to question number uh, 19. But uh, the short version of that is because the Ames table saw does not have the emergency stop feature that other table saws have. Okay, question number 20. Let's go with Moses. Um, what are metal is, that is being drilled or cut by a power tool must be clamped down in place. Students are not allowed to hold it by hand because they can cut their hand. That's what I said. Um, well, I see where you're coming from because, but I mean, what if, what if it's possible to hold the, the wood or metal and still keep your fingers so that they're more than four inches away, right? So then uh, you would think that it would be safe because your finger is far enough away from the cutting blade, but it's actually not, okay? There's another reason why it, you should never handhold stuff that is being cut or drilled by a power tool. The answer is because that power tool has a lot of strength. And in fact, let me uh, stop sharing so I can show um, the, so here you're holding something and then the, the blade here is spinning. That, that blade is really strong and it can sometimes grab that wood and rip it out of your hand 
and sent it shooting across the room like a bullet. And I've seen that happen because this is a rule that I've seen students violate. They're in a hurry. They don't want to take the time to properly clamp the thing down. And they say, well, I can hold it with my finger being more than four inches away. I'm going to do it. And then it just rips it out of their hand and shoots it across the room. In fact, when we get into the lab, I'm going to show you there's a couple, uh, a couple dents in the wall that that's how they got there is that a piece of wood came flying across at high speed and it hit the wall and put a dent in the wall. Okay, so you must clamp your work down. We have lots of clamps, okay? So if you're ever cutting or drilling on a piece of wood or metal, you must clamp it in place. You are not allowed to hand hold it. Okay, let's move along. True and false, these ones should go a little bit more quickly here. Uh, okay, how about Zaid, number 21. Eye protection is optional if you are more than five feet away from the place where a tool is being used. Uh, false. Okay, very good. That one is false. Okay, even if you're more than five feet away, the thing could still send, send uh, little pieces of shrapnel your direction. Uh, so you must be wearing eye, tool, eye protection if anybody anywhere in the lab is using any tools. Um, I'm looking at the clock here and I'm thinking we need to pick up the pace. So tell you what I'm going to do for these next ones. I'm going to just tell you the answers. Okay, uh, so number 22, hot metal thrown into water to cool it off can create, create steam hot enough to burn the skin. The answer to that one is true. Uh, we have a welder in, in, the, uh, in our tool collection. One of them is a welder. If any of you are interested in learning how to weld, we can, uh, we can do that. Um, when you're welding on something, it will get really, really hot. And we keep a bucket of water nearby to cool it off. That, uh, when you put that hot piece of metal in the water, it'll create steam and you could get burned by the steam. Question number 23, eye protection optional if you're using a handsaw? Zzz, no. Eye protection must be worn if you're using any kind of tool at all, even a handsaw as opposed to a power saw. Question number 24, once metal is no longer bright orange from welding, it's cool enough to pick up with your hands. Bzz, false, definitely not. Even though it may not be glowing orange anymore, you could still get burned. You must allow it to cool completely. Question 25, after passing the test you're now taking, you may operate any tool in the shop. Bzz, false, okay? The test that you are now taking gives you permission to be in the lab. It does not give you permission to use any tool in the lab. You must be individually trained on every tool in there. Question 26, ultraviolet light from the welding arc can cause sunburned skin. Yes, that is true. If we use the welder, anyone who's anywhere in the room must uh, get out of the way um, so you don't get burned by the ultraviolet light. And the person who is doing the welding must wear long sleeves, gloves, must cover your face. You must not have any exposed skin because you can get burned. Just, just, a, a, just a couple minutes worth of welding can give you a really bad sunburn. Question number 22 or 27, sorry. Open toe shoes, acceptable wear in the shop as long as you're not lifting heavy equipment, bzz, false. You must never wear open, open toe shoes in the shop must be closed, clo closed toe. 28, eye protection is required if, if pressurized air is present anywhere in the robot or other object that people are working on, even if the robot is powered down at the time. That is true. Some of the robots that we built in the past and some of the things that we might possibly build uh, when we get back to school, we, we use pressurized air. And pressurized air, will be in a canister like this. If you see this on any device, this is a pressurized air canister. And some people think that if you cut off the electricity to the device, to the robot or whatever, you think that it's now safe to work on, but no. 
If you have pressurized air in here, this pressurized air is still in there even if the electricity is turned off. So what you must always do is whenever you're using pressurized air, you have to have a thing called a bleed valve so that once you turn off the power to the robot, you can open up the bleed valve and let all the pressurized air escape. Only after you've removed the pressurized air is it then safe to work on the robot. Okay, question 29, any type of fire extinguisher may be used on any type of fire. This is, that is false. There are three general categories of fires, which means there are three categories of fire extinguishers. So wood fires are considered to be a type A fire, wood or paper. Flammable liquid is considered to be a type B fire. Electrical equipment that's on fire is considered to be a, a type C fire. Now, uh, when you buy a fire extinguisher, you need to look at the, the letter code. Most, if not all, of the fire extinguishers that, you, that are available to be purchased today, if you look on the label, it will say ABC. If you see ABC, that means that that fire extinguisher can be used on wood and liquid and electrical fires. Now, there might be a couple old fire extinguishers lying around. Now, at Ames, we don't have any of these old ones, but if you go somewhere else, you might see an old type of fire extinguisher that uh, doesn't say ABC on it. Uh, so if that's the case, you need to make sure that you know what kind of fire extinguisher it is. Um, back in the old days, they used to have fire extinguishers where what they would do is they would just have a big canister of water with pressurized air inside it. So when you squeeze the handle, it squirts out a lot of water. Well, those kind of fire extinguishers work great on type A fires. You know, remember type A is wood or paper. So if you spray water on a wood or paper fire, yeah, puts it out wonderfully, does a great job. But if you type, if you put it on a type B fire, which is a flammable liquid. So imagine you've got a bunch of paint thinner that may be spilled or whatever in a caught fire. So if you put, if, if you have a bunch of burning paint thinner and you put water on that, it's not gonna put it out. In fact, it's gonna make it worse. It's gonna spread the liquid everywhere else. Uh, and uh, so it's gonna do more harm than good. And electrical fires, if you spray water in an electrical fire, water conducts electricity and so uh, you could electrocute everybody around you, okay? So, so don't just assume that any type of fire extinguisher can be used on any type of fire. Um, only if it's an, what we call an ABC fire extinguisher, which the fire extinguishers in the Ames lab are ABC fire extinguishers, so they're okay. All right, let's move along here. We're running short on time. Um, so, it's okay to work on an energized robot as long as you're careful not to touch the live wi electrical wires. Bzz, wrong. Never work on an energized robot or an energized anything else for that matter. You must turn off the electricity before you're allowed to work on it. Question 31, all injuries, no matter how minor, must be reported to the instructor. Yes, that is true. Okay, I need to know about any injuries that occur, no matter how minor. 32, you should wear gloves when operating a drill press. This is one that most people get wrong. Most, pe most people think that you are safer if you wear gloves when you're operating a drill press. It's actually not the case. If you wear a glove, and so imagine here's, here's the drill bit and it's spinning and you're wearing a glove and if you accidentally allow your finger to get too close to it and it touches it, the, the drill bit or if it's a bandsaw, you know, the, the saw blade, it can catch onto that the glove and it can pull your finger in. So it's actually safer to be barehanded when you're working with a drill press or a bandsaw or anything like that that might possibly catch on the fabric of the glove, okay? It's actually safer to be barehanded, okay? So be careful about this one. This is one that very many people get this one wrong. Okay, the answer for number 32 is false. 33, shavings of aluminum and iron oxide must not be allowed to mix together. 
That one is true. And the reason for that is because of uh, if you mix these together, you create a substance that is called thermite. You might have heard of thermite. Mythbusters likes to do stuff with thermite. Um, most people have seen that episode. And if you have, you've seen, it's quite impressive. Um, it's not explosive, but what, it, what happens is it does burn at an extremely high temperature and it's very bad stuff. So now why is this important? Well, for you guys, it's especially important because quite often people will use the drill press or the bandsaw on aluminum or iron on, on some type of metal. And then they walk away without cleaning up after themselves. So you have all these aluminum shavings or, or iron shavings lying around. And then somebody else comes along and they use the machine. And so if, if everybody's using the, the drill press or the machine or uh, milling machine or whatever, and if you don't clean up after yourselves, then what you can end up with is aluminum particles and iron oxide particles mixing together. And then what we have on the tabletop is thermite and that can be bad. It can be very bad. Okay, so don't do that. Um, okay, 34, if you wear prescription glasses, then you don't need to wear safety glasses. Bzz, definitely false. Prescription glasses are not made out of safety glass. If a piece of metal comes along here and hits this glass, this glass will shatter and then I'll have little pieces of, of shattered glass in my eye, okay? Safety glasses are made out of a special type of material that will not shatter if it gets hit. And by the way, regular glasses, they also don't have any side protection. Safety glasses have side protection. Okay, so if you wear regular glasses, you must wear a special kind of safety glass that goes over the top, which we do have. Um, and uh, so that is a requirement. 35, common sense and, uh, and good judgment will prevent all accidents. Bzzz. I wish this was true. But accidents do happen, even when you're really careful. So be aware of that. Uh, 36, horseplay is allowed in the shop as long as nobody's using any tools at the time. Bzz, false. We have lots of dangerous stuff in the shop where you can get hurt if you bump up against it, even if it's turned off. Horseplay is never, ever allowed in the lab. OK, 37, why can oily rags or rags soaked in paint or other solvents. Why must they be stored in a metal airtight container? Well, the answer to this one is one that we've already talked about, spontaneous combustion. We've already talked about that. So what I need to see here is I need to see the words spontaneous combustion. I need to see those written in here. Number 38, explain why great care must be taken when handling metal around a, me a welding and grinding area. Okay. Because mainly there's two things that I want to see here. One is because whenever you've been welding or grinding, the thing you've been working on might be hot. So, so number one, might be hot. Number two, might be sharp. If you've been grinding something, it might have sharp edges on it. And if you've been welding on it, okay, maybe, maybe not so much when you're welding, but when you're grinding, yes. So the answers that I want to see written in here in your own handwriting might be hot, might be sharp. 39, explain what you should do if you find a tool that's broken. Alert the instructor, okay? Do not just put it back on the shelf. Either bring it to my, either bring it to me if it's a hand tool or bring the condition to my attention, okay? I need to know if you suspect that any tool is broken, I need to know about it immediately. Number 40, explain what you do in the, in the event of an accident. Number one, give first aid if applicable. Number two, tell the instructor. Okay, in that order. Okay. Is, now, if it's, if, you, if it's only a little tiny bit of blood oozing out, it's not so important, but if it's bleeding profusely, Give first aid first. Tell me about it second or, or simultaneously. Okay, 41, an example of when you should wear gloves and when you should not. Well, if you are welding, you must definitely wear gloves. Another time when you should definitely wear gloves is if you are handling metal that might possibly be sharp, you must wear gloves. 
Okay. And then an example when you should not wear gloves. Well, if you're operating a drill press or a, uh, a bandsaw, in any, any tool that has a moving cutting uh, blade, cut, a, you know, a, a cutting blade or a drill, any, any time that it's got a moving tool, cutting tool, that, then you must not wear gloves. It is, you should be barehanded. It is safer to be barehanded. Okay, what must you do to an energized robot before doing repairs? Well, de-energize it, turn it off. What must you do to a robot that contains pressurized air before doing repairs? Ble bleed off the air pressure, release the air pressure. 44, what should you do with a battery that's damaged in any way, visibly damaged in any way? Le okay, number one, leave it where it is. Do not pick it up and bring it to me. The reason you must not do that is because the, the batteries that we use for many of the things that we build, these the really big robot batteries, those have acid inside of them. And so if you see a battery that has a cracked case and you pick it up and walk across the room and say, hey, Mr. Hendricks here, well, you're, you might be dripping ad, a battery acid everywhere. Okay, so, so leave the battery where it is and come and get me. Question number 45, what do you do if you sulfuric acid from a battery gets on your skin? Wash it for at least five minutes. Now, five minutes might seem excessive, but it's actually not. What can happen is the sulfuric acid can get into your skin and it can go deep into your skin. So if you just give it a superficial wash, you haven't gotten all of the acid out. Wash it for at least five minutes minutes. Make sure that you say that in writing, in your own handwriting there, at least five minutes. Number 40, after you've finished using either the drill press or the milling machine, what must you do before you walk away? Well, number one, remove the drill bit or the mill bit. Uh, and number two, you must clean up. Okay, do not walk away leaving uh, metal filings or wood shavings there. You must clean up. Okay, last page here, and we've got nine minutes left, so I think we're going to make it. Okay, number 47. Um, I think we have enough time. Let's have you guys, anybody want to unmute yourself and tell me what do you think is the problem in this picture that you see right here? Uh, there is possibly sharp metal hanging off the edge in a spot where someone could bump into it and cut themselves. You got it exactly right. You, you guys should always assume, if, if you see a piece of metal lying around, you should always assume that it has razor sharp edges. Now, hopefully it won't. If the person who cut the metal did their job right, immediately after cutting it, they will hopefully have, have uh, file down all the sharp edges, but they might not have done their job right. So if you if you see this situation, you should assume that that's a piece of razor sharp metal hanging off the edge of a table. If somebody walks by, they could slice their stomach wide open. Okay, never leave it hanging off the edge of the table like that. Okay, next one here. This guy right here. Somebody, what do you what do you think is wrong with this picture here? can bend too much to the point that it breaks? Uh, that is possible, but metal is pretty flexible. Uh, and it, you know, if you ruin the metal, that's obviously bad, but it's not a safety problem. I want to know what's the safety problem here. Now, some people say that it's because they're worried that the guy is not wearing gloves. But I think if you look closely here, you can see he actually is wearing gloves. And you can see he's wearing safety glasses. And so everything looks good there. Um, the problem in this case is that that piece of metal is too big for one person to handle by themselves. Okay, if you're handling a piece of metal that big, you need to have a helper. So please write that in there. Metal is too big for one person to safely handle by themselves. How about this one? What do you see wrong with this one?
loose hair and jewelry. Okay, so there's several things wrong with this. Okay, so the one person, uh, I heard somebody say loose hair. And so you're absolutely right there. So this girl, this girl right here, her hair needs to be tied back. In fact, you can see it extends all the way down here. So that is one problem, but that's not the only problem. And I think I heard somebody say loose jewelry. So yes, you see that yellow band on his arm there? And also the watch. Now the watch might, might not be considered loose, but uh, I consider it to be loose. Even if you have a tight fitting watch, um, my rule is you need to take off your watches. If you're gonna be using, using any power tools, I want you to remove your watches and also your rings. And for certain, if you have any kind of a bracelet, okay, that all needs to come off. Okay, so there's two things wrong with this picture, but actually there's the third. Anybody know the third thing that's wrong with this picture? I'm gonna take a while and say there are too many people in one area. You got it exactly right. There's too many people. Remember the operating zone? You remember the arm's length rule? So if this guy right here is the one that's operating the tool, these people must stay more than an arm's length away from him. So we got, so we got three things wrong with this particular tool here, or this particular picture. Okay, I think this is our last one here. Okay, so somebody help me out here. What do you see wrong with this picture? No glasses. Very good, no safety glasses. But that's not the only thing that's wrong. What else is wrong with this picture? He's just no free gloves. holding it. He's free holding it, okay? That is a definite no-no, okay? Now, wh why, why is he tempted to free hold it? Because there's something he should have done that he didn't do. What is it? What is that? Why does he feel the need to, to handhold this piece of metal? It possibly could be hard to clamp down. Well, it might be hard to clamp down, but even if it's hard to clamp down, you need to find a way to do it, okay? You are not allowed to drill on any piece that is not clamped down. Now, and I agree that this is, this one might be a little bit tricky to clamp down, but that's not an excuse. If you, if you can't figure out how to clamp something down, come and get me and I will help you, okay? But you are not ever allowed to handhold something that you're drilling, uh, okay? Uh, there is one exception and that's the bandsaw. And when we go into Ames, I will show you the bandsaw. The bandsaw is a tool that is designed in such a way that, it, that you can handhold the material safely on a bandsaw. But that is the one and only tool. Drill presses, you can't handhold it. Milling machines, you can't handhold it. Uh, miter saws, you cannot handhold it, okay? Only the bandsaw is the only thing that you're allowed to handhold. Okay, well, I think we are done with the safety test. Uh, and all of this has been recorded. And so I think I'm, I'm gonna put this up on Canvas so you can refer back to it if you ever have questions. All right, so what I need you guys to do uh, in order to prove to me that you have now passed the safety test is I need you to uh, upload the document where, you know, this document that you see right here with all of your answers handwritten on it in your handwriting. And up at the top here, make sure that you include your name and today's date. And again, I want your name written, written in your handwriting, but please write legibly, okay? And what I want you to do is to either scan it or photograph it. Scanning it is preferred. If any of you guys have the Adobe Scan app on your phone, that is, that's so much nicer than taking a photograph. But hey, if all you got is, is photographs, then I'll, I'll accept that. So take a photograph of it, upload it to Canvas, and then that will count. Um, all right, do you have any questions? Okay, so other than, uh, than photographing this and submitting it, 
there is no uh, homework tonight. I will see you guys again next time we meet. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording now. You can go you can go ahead and type bye into the chat box.